so it was just yesterday, these days are very rich, a lot of impressions, so it seems like a long time ago, but it was just yesterday we went out to meditate at the Dungasiri cave, yesterday morning, and where the Buddha was practicing austerities with great determination and great sincerity, motivated by loving kindness, he was trying to find the deathless, he was confident that since there was death, there must be the deathless. Since there was a condition, there must be an unconditioned. He'd already cultivated the four most subtle jhanas, and he'd realized that they were not leading onwards, that they also degenerated, they'd lead to Brahman rebirths, but they didn't lead to an unconditioned state that was free of death. After that, he decided, he realized, he realized that the way to proceed would be to allow the mind to be concentrated to the level of the lower jhanas, and then to contemplate, he wondered, that may be the middle way. And he had the insight, that is the middle way. And so then he realized that he would need some food to, to support that. The body needed more food, more nourishment than it had had. So he wandered down from that mountain where we were, and he was offered some milk rice by Sujata, where we were meditating yesterday afternoon. And then that did nourish his efforts under the Bodhi tree. So he had a bath in the river, Naranjara River, which we crossed yesterday also. And we were talking about later on how the fire sermon was taught on those very same banks of that river. So it's been really wonderful, hasn't it, to, to be there and see the place and feel the vibes and, uh, and get a sense for that incredible determination. And then to contemplate the role that nourishment and uh, being able to give and being able to receive also plays in our spiritual path. And then coming back today for many hours to the Bodhi tree and uh, just feeling that amazing energy there and rejoicing in the pujas, all the colorful pujas from so many traditions. And uh, so we've had a good few days here in Bodh Gaya. I think it's been really important to give you exposure to the holy site and encourage you to practice a lot. But then we also need to remind ourselves because this is the nature of uh, unenlightened human beings, which we all are, is that because of ignorance we forget. And so by the time you've bought a shawl, a statue, a set of beads, <laughs> had a nice dinner, we, we, we have to remember where are we, what are we doing, why is Bodh Gaya so special? And uh, tomorrow morning is our last morning, so I thought I'd read this uh, excerpt from the Buddha's, the, what, how he describes his insights under the Bodhi tree before we go and take leave tomorrow as a group. So, from this book that I think most of you read, The Life of the Buddha, there are a few voices. This is the voice of the narrator. There's a first voice. But I'll, just, I'll just read it. I'm coming from different sources, basically, but I'll just read it without, uh, without qualifying the source, just to give you an idea for the contemplation. The Enlightenment itself is described in a number of discourses and from several different angles, as though one were to describe a tree from above, from below, and from various sides, or a journey by land, by water, and by air. There is a description of it as the attainment of the three true knowledges told as following upon the development of meditation. Then there are the descri descriptions of it in terms of the discovery of the structure of conditionality, in the impermanent process of being, and in terms of the search for the undeceiving interpretation, the true scale of value, in the problematic world of ideas, acts and things, probabilities and certainties. Here is a description in terms of meditation leading up to the discovery of, of the Four Noble Truths. So basically there's three ways that the Buddha's enlightenment is described, the particular insights that he had. So the first one is the Four Noble Truths. Now when I had eaten solid food and had regained strength, then quite secluded from sensual desires, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abode in the first meditation, which was accompanied by thinking and exploring, with happiness and pleasure born of seclusion. But I allowed no such pleasant feeling as arose in me to gain power over my mind. With the stilling of thinking and exploring, I entered upon and abode in the second meditation, which has internal confidence and singleness of mind without thinking and exploring, 
with happiness and pleasure born of concentration, but I allowed no such pleasant feeling as arose in me to gain power over my mind. With the fading as well of happiness, I abode in onlooking equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, I entered upon and abode in the third meditation, referring to which the Noble Ones announce, He has a pleasant abiding who looks on with equanimity and is mindful. But I allowed no such pleasant feeling as arose in me to gain power over my mind. With the abandoning of bodily pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of mental joy and grief, I entered upon and abode in the fourth meditation, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and the purity of whose mindfulness is due to onlooking equanimity. But I allowed no such pleasure as arose in me to gain power over my mind. So, just as I was saying before, the Buddha's insight that he was going to allow himself this mental pleasure, remember we were talking about the fact that in the cave the Buddha didn't allow his mind to absorb into any of the meditations even though he had mastered them all. He was exploring painful, racking feelings and he was wondering through patiently enduring and contemplating them if that was a way out of samsara, but he realized that it wasn't. So that description is how he allowed his mind to enter the first, second, third and then the fourth jhanas. And it's very important to notice that he's his mindfulness isn't affected by the pleasure. So we're talking about extremely subtle and extremely blissful pleasure. But the Buddha's uh, mindfulness and wisdom is so well cultivated, he was able to enter those absorptions without any attachment to them. With that sentence, I allowed no such pleasure as arose in me to gain power over my mind. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, and rid of imperfection, so we often talk, I often talk when you do day-long meditation retreats or these uh, week-long nine-day retreats about the five hindrances. So that's what most of us experience a lot of the time in meditation, one of the five hindrances. In order to be able to enter any of the jhanas, the five hindrances need to be completely pacified. So that's what Lord Buddha did. And obviously when you go into the fourth jhana, which has uh, mindfulness on looking on pure equanimity, those hindrances have been very, very well suppressed and the mind is uh, very powerful and as he is saying purified, bright, unblemished and rid of imperfection. So through this when it had become malleable, steady and attained to imperturbability, I directed, I inclined my mind to the knowledge and recollection of past lives. So with that enormous amount of energy that's come from those entering those jhanas and then directing his mind. I recollected my manifold past lives, that is to say, one birth, two, three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births, many ages of world contraction, many ages of world expansion, many ages of world contraction and expansion. I was there so named of such a race with such an appearance, such food, such experience of pleasure and pain, such a life term and passing away thence. I reappeared elsewhere, and there too I was so named of such a race, with such an appearance, such an experience of pleasure and pain, such a life term, passing away thence, I reappeared here. Thus with details and particulars I recollected my manifold past lives. This was the first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who is diligent, ardent, and self-controlled. But I allowed no such pleasure, no such pleasant feeling as arose in me to gain power over my mind. So recollecting past lives in that disciplined way is regarded as true knowledge. And uh, we know from when uh, Anya Kondanya had his insight when the Buddha was teaching the Dhammachaka Sutta, his his insight was, all that has the nature to arise has the nature to cease. So we could imagine, or presume, I would say, that the Buddha is seeing that, isn't he? This life arises, this life ceases, this life arises, this life ceases. He's seeing, uh, and there's this much pleasure, and there's this much pain, and then according to karma, it's changing, it's changing, it's changing. So can you imagine, the, with that powerful mind, recollecting a hundred thousand past lives in a few hours, what that experience of impermanence must be like, with that kind of laser-like precision, seeing with pure clarity 
birth, aging, death, birth, aging, and death, this much pleasure, this much suffering, and then born there, and then born here, and then born here. So uh, obviously a great, uh, great insight into impermanence. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, I directed, I inclined my mind to the knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, happy and unhappy, in their destinations. I understood how beings pass on according to their actions. These worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech and mind, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in states of privation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death have reappeared in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. Thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, happy and unhappy in their destinations. I understood how beings pass on according to their actions. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the second watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who is diligent, ardent and self-controlled but I allowed no such pleasant feeling as arose in me to gain power over my mind. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, I directed, I inclined my mind to the knowledge of exhaustion of taints. I had direct knowledge as it actually is that this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, and this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I had direct knowledge as it actually is these are the taints, that is the origin of the taints, this is the cessation of the taints, and this is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. Knowing thus and seeing thus, my heart was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. When liberated, there came the knowledge, it is liberated, I had direct knowledge, birth is exhausted, the holy life has been lived out, what has to be done is done, there is no more of this to come. This was the third knowledge attained to me in the third watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who is diligent, ardent and self-controlled. But I allowed no such pleasant feeling as arose in me to gain power over my mind. It's fairly self-explanatory, but just uh, speaking about the Eightfold Path, which is the Buddha, how he describes the uh, the path leading to the cessation of suffering, which is he, he's just had the insight into. What is there, of course, is this Samma Sati and Samma Samadhi. So when he's recollecting his past lives and recollecting the past lives of other beings and seeing their impermanence, there's Samma Samadhi and there's Samma Sati, seeing the characteristics and natures of nature of things. And basically this is what liberates minds. This is what liberated Lord Buddha's mind. With that very, very clear Mindfulness, seeing things as they are, arising, ceasing, arising, ceasing, with a mind which is well directed through having cultivated samadhi, seeing things as they are, he had his insight into the cause of suffering and was able to let go of them simply by seeing things as they are. And we're about to talk about Paticca Samapada, that's another way of describing the Buddha's insight. It's because of ignorance that there is delusion. So the antidote to an ignorance is not knowing. Delusion is seeing incorrectly. So seeing something deludedly. So what mindfulness and samadhi and concentration do is just having a look at it, how it really is. That's the antidote to ignorance and delusion. If ignorance is not knowing and delusion is seeing incorrectly by just having a really, really precise and clear look at how things are, ignorance disappears. And what it's replaced by is knowledge, knowing things as they are. So they came, the knowledge, it is liberated. So knowing this and seeing this, my heart was liberated. Knowing and seeing, my heart was liberated. So that's what we're all training in. And uh, we're taking baby steps in the beginning, and that's okay. 
that this is where it's going, and that's really uh, ins inspiring and encouraging to know that the, the ordinary mindfulness that we're all training with now, and the little bit of concentration that we have, is exactly what we need to be working with, and we just need to keep working with it until it gets powerful enough, and basically we can have this very same insight. That's why the Buddha was able to teach so many people, and so many other people were, were liberated through seeing things as they are, with mindfulness and concentration. So there's a second description now, in terms of the structure of conditionality or dependent arising. Before my enlightenment, when I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I thought, this world has fallen into a sloth, for it is born, ages and dies. It passes away and reappears, and yet it knows no escape from this suffering. When will an escape from this suffering be described? I thought, what is there when aging and death come to be? What is their necessary condition? Then with ordered attention I came to understand, birth is there when aging and death come to be. Birth is a necessary condition for them. I thought, what is there when birth comes to be? What is its necessary condition? Then with ordered attention I came to understand, being is there. When birth comes to be, being is a necessary condition for that. I thought, what is there when being comes to be? What is its necessary condition? Then with ordered attention I came to understand, clinging is there when being comes to be. Clinging is a necessary condition for that. Craving, and then it's abbreviated now, what is the necessary condition for clinging? Craving is there when the clinging comes to be. What is the necessary condition for the craving? Feeling of pleasure or pain or neither pleasure and pain is there when craving comes to be. What is there for feeling to come into be? Contact is there, sense contact. What is there for sense contact to come into being? The sixfold sense space is there when contact comes into being. I thought, what is there when this sixfold sense space comes to be? What is its necessary condition? With ordered attention I came to understand, name and form is there when the sixfold sense space comes to be. Name and form is a necessary condition for that. I thought, what is there when name and form comes to be? What is its necessary condition? And with ordered attention I came to understand, consciousness is there when name and form comes to be. Consciousness is a necessary condition for that. I thought, what is there when consciousness comes to be? What is its necessary condition? Then with ordered attention I came to understand name and form is there when consciousness comes to be. Name and form is a necessary condition for that. I thought, this consciousness turns back upon itself. It does not extend beyond name and form. And this is how it happens, whether one is being born, aging or dying, passing away or reappearing. That is to say, it is with name and form as condition that consciousness comes to be, with consciousness as condition, name and form, with name and form as condition, the sixfold sense space for contact. The sixfold sense space as condition, contact, with contact as condition, feeling, with feeling as condition, craving, with craving as condition, clinging, with clinging as condition, being, with being as condition, birth, with birth as condition, aging and death come to be. And also, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. That is how there is an origin to this whole aggregate mass of suffering. The origin, such was the insight, the knowledge, the understanding, the vision, the light that arose in me about things not heard before. I thought, what is not there when no aging and death come to be? With the cessation of what is there, cessation of aging and death. Then with ordered attention I came to understand, when there is no birth, no aging and death come to be. With cessation of birth, there is cessation of aging and death. When there is no being, no birth comes to be. When there is no clinging, no being comes to be. When there is no craving, no clinging comes to be. When there is no feeling, no craving comes to be. When there is no sense contact, no feelings come to be. When there is no sixfold base, no contact comes to be. When there is no name and form, no sixfold base comes to be. When there is no consciousness, no name and form comes to be. I thought, what is not there when no consciousness comes to be, with cessation of what is there, cessation of consciousness? Then with ordered attention I came to understand, when there is no name and form, no consciousness comes to be, with cessation of name and form, there is cessation of consciousness. I thought, this is the path to enlightenment that I have now reached. That is to say, with the cessation of name and form, 
there is cessation of consciousness. With cessation of consciousness, sensation of name and form. With the cessation of name and form, cessation of the sixfold base. With the cessation of the sixfold base, cessation of contact. With cessation of contact, cessation of feeling. With cessation of feeling, cessation of craving. With cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. With cessation of clinging, cessation of being. With cessation of being, cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death cease, and also sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. That is how there is a cessation to this whole aggregate mass of suffering. The cessation, the cessation was the insight, the knowledge, the understanding, the vision, the light, and the rose in me about things not heard before. Suppose a man wandering in a forest wilderness found an ancient path, an ancient trail, traveled by men of old, and he followed it up, and by doing so he discovered an ancient city, an ancient royal capital, where men of old had lived, with parks and groves and lakes, walled around and beautiful to see. So I too found the ancient path, the ancient trail, traveled by the fully enlightened ones of old. And what was that ancient path, that ancient trail? It was this noble eightfold path, that is to say, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. I followed it up, and by doing so, I directly knew aging and death, their origin, their cessation, and the way leading to their cessation. I directly knew birth, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation. I knew being, clinging, craving, feeling, contact, the sixfold base, name and form, and consciousness. I directly knew formations, their origin, their cessation, and the way leading to their cessation. So this is the same night, and in the first example it's explained as recollecting lives, the Bodhisattva's personal previous lives in the first watch, and in the second watch he's recollecting the, the lives, past lives of others, and he's seeing uh, the qualities, this much pleasure, this much pain, this appearance, this much characteristic. But it's, as the narrator said, it's looking from the, basically the same contemplation, but with a little bit of nuance in terms of where Bodhisattva is doing the contemplating. So you, but you could see with all of that, seeing birth, seeing death, seeing birth, seeing death, and seeing karma, and then seeing the attachment. You know, the Buddha is investigating the clinging, the attachment, the craving, based on the form, and they're seeing the impermanence. So, you know, he's getting meticulously down to the details of the conditions, and he was able to see that uh, this 12 links in forward and reverse, and by seeing, once again, by seeing it clearly as it is, uh, the taints were destroyed, delusion is destroyed, and ignorance is uprooted. There is another way it's described as well. Finally, there is a description in terms of the right judgment of the world of conditioned acts and ideas, classified in this discourse into five aggregates, within which all conditioned experience, when analyzed, can be classified. Before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I thought, in case of material form, of feeling, pleasure or pain, or neither pleasure or pain, of perception, of formations, of consciousness, what is the gratification, what the danger, and what the escape, then I thought, in the case of each, the bodily pleasure and mental joy that arise in dependence on these things, the five aggregates, are the gratification. The fact that these things are all impermanent, painful, and subject to change is the danger. The disciplining and abandoning of desire and lust for them is the escape. As long as I did not know by direct knowledge as it actually is that such was the gratifi gratification, such the danger, and such the escape, in the case of these five aggregates affected by clinging, so long did I make no claim to have discovered the enlightenment that is supreme in the world with its deities, its maras, its Brahma divinities, in this generation with its monks and Brahmins, with its princes and men, but as soon as I knew by direct knowledge, as it actually is, that such is the gratification, such the danger, and such the escape, in the case of five aggregates affected by clinging, then I claim to have discovered the enlightenment that is supreme in the world with its deities and maras, its Brahma divinities, in this generation with its monks and Brahmins, with its princes and men. Being myself subject to birth, aging, ailment, death, sorrow and defilement, 
seeing danger in what is subject to those things and seeking the unborn, unaging, unailing, the deathless, sorrowless, undefiled, supreme cessation of bondage, Nibbana, I attained it. The knowledge and vision arose in me, my deliverance is unassailable. This is my last birth, there is now no renewal of being. Sadhu. 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 This is really beautiful what the Bodhisattva's intuition was. Because there is birth, aging, ailment, death and sorrow, and defilement, he was seeking the unborn, the unaging, the unailing, the deathless, the sorrowless, the undefiled. And he was extremely determined in finding it. And he did. And it's a very subtle uh, discovery that required, as we were talking about, those incredibly well-honed and very precise spiritual faculties. And we, we, we also talk often, I often talk when we contemplate these five spiritual powers that uh, Buddha said himself as a Bodhisattva when he was practicing the austerities in the cave and Mara came to uh, tempt him away from that. You know, he basically said, these five spiritual powers are very well developed in me. I do not need merit. Mara was trying to pull him away from his austerities and encourage him to go and do practices for the sake of merit. And he said, go and talk about merit to people who need it. I have a lot of that. I don't need merit and I have these five spiritual powers and I'm going to carry on with my contemplation. So with that great faith, he's got faith that there is a deathless. He's got faith that there is an unconditioned. He has faith that there's an unborn. Even though he hasn't seen it yet, he knows it's there and he's going to find it. Really extraordinary determination. Probably conditioned in part by having trained with previous Buddhas. You know, he has heard teachings about the deathless and he's by, by this stage, He's paid respect to, I would assume, any number of arahants. He's listened to teachings in past lives by many people who, who've uh, realized the deathless. So I think this is an important factor in why that Bodhisattva has this extraordinary, I know it's there, I've heard about it a lot. I've paid respects to people who have realized it, and now I'm going to realize it. Another, just another aspect about seeing things clearly as they are, this third process, Buddha is basically talking about the attachment. This is an important part of the, the 12 links of, of uh, dependent arising and back, is this pleasure, being attached to the pleasure that's available in the five khandhas. That's a large part of the cause for dying and picking them up again. Seeing that aging and death is associated with them, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair, separation from the love and all the other stuff that comes with having five hundred, seeing that very, very clearly, the attachment is weakened and uprooted. But basically you see it's not worth it. There's much more suffering and there's much more dukkha than there is pleasure. So the attachment, the deluded attachment is based on the belief that it's worth it. There's this pleasure that I can get. But this very, very clear mindfulness that's capable of looking at the whole picture exactly as it is, sees that it's not worth it, it's suffering, it's much, much more suffering than pleasure. And in seeing that, realizes a pleasure which is superior, which is uh, our, we have the uh, capacity to realize that. Fortunately for us, we don't have to Shortcut work yeah. quite so yeah. hard okay. <laughs> <laughs> because the Buddha spelled out to us yes. in very different, many different ways the five spiritual powers, the eightfold path, or simply Sila Samadhi Panya in its most uh, succinct way, understanding how to get enlightened. Keep your Sila, develop your meditation, and keep contemplating <coughs> Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, and basically you will get enlightened. And, uh, but we did need him to do all of this extremely hard, heroic work to be able to explain it to us. And so I'm just hoping that by reading this, when we go back there tomorrow morning, we remember again, wow, the Buddha's effort was really extraordinary and his, the, you know, the power and the, the wieldliness of his mind to, to, to achieve that contemplation in one night, recollecting a thousand, a hundred thousand past lives of himself and others, and then seeing this uh, 12 links of dependent arising in forward and reverse, in understanding the five khandhas as, as separate phenomena that have come together due to grasping, 
and seeing what the grasping is based on, the attachment to the pleasure, and then just seeing that there's much more suffering than pleasure, and seeing that it's not a self as well, letting go of it all, with uh, samma sati, samma samadhi, and the right thinking, the right <coughs> contemplation. So then he has his uh, lion's roar, what does he say? Seeking but not finding the house builder, I travel through the round of countless spurs. Oh, painful is birth, but ever and again. House builder, you have now been seen. You shall not build the house again. Your rafters have been broken down, your ridge pole is demolished too. My mind has now attained the unformed Nibbana and reached the end of every kind of craving. Isn't that nice? So we, have, we owe a big thank you to Bikram Yanamoli <laughs> for compiling that. When the uh, Lord Buddha, when the Bodhisattva was crossed the river and he had his bath, he was uh, he was handled handed eight bundles of uh, kusha grass, which he made his seat under the Bodhi tree. And there's uh, I'd just like to talk about some of the symbolic meaning of the. You imagine <coughs> how much effort and time has gone into getting the conditions right for this this night, you know. And so of course everyone's in place. Sujata's so there with the milk rice. The Brahmins there with the eight bundles of grass, all these people <laughs> making merit. And so the eight bundles of grass represent the eight worldly concerns, the praise and the blame, the pleasure and the pain and the pain, the gain and loss, the fame and obscurity, those worldly phenomena which most people are completely obsessed by. We all want pleasure, we all want to avoid pain, we all want a good reputation, we don't want a bad reputation, we want people to say nice things to us, and we would prefer to be... Uh, you know, light, we'd rather be happy than miserable. What, what sitting on those eight bundles of grass represented was that the Bodhisattva was going to overcome the eight worldly concerns on that night. Another thing I find interesting is that he says that uh, his practice of austerity is, wasn't the middle way. So now he's going to practice the middle way. And even with this practicing of the middle way, he basically sat under the Bodhi tree and he says, I'm not moving until I get enlightened. So it's just really, I think it's really important to understand that the middle way is often misunderstood. And if, because we do have attachment to pleasure, and because we are affected by sensuality, we do shirk hardship. And we can sometimes say, not, not, perhaps not correctly or not truthfully, that's not the middle way. That's, that's too austere. But, and so it's nice to recollect well, what, what was the Buddha's middle way. Basically, when he sat under that tree, he says, I'm not getting up until I'm enlightened. <laughs> so it wasn't, uh, I'm going for a nap. <laughs> it wasn't, I'm going to have a nap middle way, was it? <laughs> so, it was a very determined middle way. <laughs> I have to say that to myself <laughs> before my nap. So. <laughs> Very interesting, I've mentioned it a few times, which is that people with the divine eye faculty can see other subtle phenomena, that that place was also the place where the three previous Buddhas of this eon were also enlightened, and the next Buddha, Maitreya, will be enlightened there, according to what Arjuna Nand has told me anyway. So uh, it would be interesting to see what the Bodhisattva can see when he approaches that tree, you know. It would be interesting, what does he actually see? There must be something very special. Does anyone have any questions or comments about what we were just reading? Just one question, Ajahn. I thought the Buddha said to understand that it's a pleasure in the norm myself. But here, it's not having a pleasure, but it's not a tension for it. He says it's a pleasure that he allows himself, he allows himself it because he knows he knows he won't be attached to it. So it's like that was the thing about the austerity, because he wasn't allowing his mind to in the cave, he wasn't allowing it at all. Uh, probably suspecting that the, that the pleasure was uh, dangerous if not handled properly. And that's why you have these Brahma realms full of Brahma dancers that, that didn't look at, have on looking equanimity and mindfulness all the time. Because you need to have the mindfulness and equanimity before entering the jhana and after the jhana so that you don't get attached.
attached to it. So he has that. And so he's a... But I think in terms of people who aren't that well developed, basically, you will get attached to them when you start to experience them. And then you have to you have to have your wisdom contemplations. You know, after the after the Ajahn Anan places a lot of emphasis upon if anyone does whatever degree of concentration, no emphasis to talk about jhanas yet, but whatever degree of concentration that you can experience in meditation, he says to allow yourself to feel as much peace as you possibly can so that the mind feels content. He doesn't he says being attached to samadhi the Mahasi side or tradition can be a bit down on you note everything, note everything, note everything you don't allow the mind to get peaceful, you get attached to it he says attachment to jhana means that you enter it for three months and then you come out again and you have a few meals and you have a bath and you enter it again for three months <laughs> that's attachment to samadhi which in places where we are was really occurring these kind of, uh, some of these Napa hair aesthetics and, and some of these Rishis, Rishis in Walter's Peak area where we're going, some of these people would have had the most profound samadhi that really could do that. That's attachment to samadhi. For us who are working with our momentary and our vipajari, our neighborhood samadhi, but Ajahn Ali is saying, allow the mind to become as full of contentedness and peace as possible, but when it moves from that peace, you contemplate impermanence of feelings, or you contemplate the body in terms of parts, so it's like this is a really important that right from now that we're training in those other aspects of the eight four part, the right thinking and contemplating in skillful ways. Basically you have to contemplate impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, not self, look at the drawbacks of sensuality, look at the drawbacks of breaking the precepts, you know, just keep honing that right view. Be generous, keep the precepts, look at the drawbacks of not keeping them, recollect karma, you know, basically keeping the mind so that you have hearing and ottapar, you have conscience. And then, uh, but establishing this habit of when you come out of the peacefulness, you investigate the truth. Because that's the habit you'll take with you, so that when you do get to others, and we all will if we keep practicing, that you have that tendency when you come out of it to investigate. It's really important that we lay that habit now. And, uh, but not to be frightened of peacefulness too. It's really important that we get some. It's really important that we cultivate some samadhi to the extent that we can. Riyadh and Ayan explains constantly that that's what will make your mindfulness powerful and it's what will give the wisdom a sharp a sharpness, enough power to cut through the delusion. So we do have to cultivate the peacefulness and we will get attached to it. But basically, it's, it's better than being attached to coarse sensuality. So the Buddha, Buddha was saying he sees no harm in the pleasure. It's not a harmful pleasure. The attachment to it is harmful. But I don't see that we have a choice in the beginning we will get attached and then with any attachment you have to look at the downside of it so suppose suppose you get jhana and you're attached to your jhana the downside of that is that you're not taking your opportunity to develop wisdom and you're not undoing the causes for rebirth that's the downside you have to be reborn with the Brahma when you when that karma expires you might not be a Buddhist teacher so then you're not out of samsara so it's like you're seeing danger in samsara you have to have an intention to go beyond it, keep investigating. Yeah. I wish, I wish, I wish that was the attachment I was going to have. One day. I, I came up with the the uh, Janice, uh, uh, she, she said, said exactly the same thing. She, she, she said that the joy that you get from the Janice just stick with it because it helps you to get on the cushion. And then the, the thing that Ajahn Nam would add to it is when the mind leaves from its peaceful state, which it will, is to investigate then. Because that's when the mind has power and clarity and can see things clearly. So it's uh, just having that as just remember that. When, you, when that peaceful, what happens is after a peaceful mind state, the hindrances are suppressed, there's not much obvious suffering. So you don't want to investigate, you want to enjoy it. We all have this kind of like, okay, we go out and we strive, don't we? But we come back and it's dinner time, and then it's nap time. <laughs> this is very deep tendency for all of us. And then it's like, okay, <laughs> after dinner and after a nap, you have to do some work. <laughs> so it's, kind of, it's really important to hear, at, hear that and to have the intention to develop the concentration, but also to keep up with the concentration once, once we have it so that we can uh, weaken the delusion 
and, and the ignorance and see things truthfully. I just want to say also at this point, I think it's going really well, and I'm really, I'm really happy with how how well everyone's cooperating, and um, I'm enjoying being here with you. It's, uh, it's, I think it was a really nice idea to spend these like five days, a couple of days of doing everything together. But now that you're here, you know, uh, I think there's a bit of a downside to leading things too much. I think I have to lead things a certain amount, but I also want you guys to develop that determination and your own creativity. Like when we say, okay, we're going to the temple, but make it work for you. Find yourself a place to sit, go out and get yourself some flowers, and these become your memories. Otherwise, you'll have this memory of Ajahn Mahal leading a pilgrimage and the bus and the group and the group thing. But it's like another reason I want us to have repeated exposure to Vulture's Peak as well. Is that they'll become your memories and you're, you're establishing this habit of walking up that mountain, finding a quiet place to meditate, which you know we need to do for a few more lifetimes probably, which is just establishing that intention, that habit, walk up the mountain, go somewhere quiet, meditate, go back to the Bodhi tree, you know, meditate. And, uh, and I, I think we have got a nice, so far, a really nice um, balance of doing things together and then relaxing a little and doing things privately and then coming back together. I'm very happy with everyone's cooperation and harmony. And uh, I think we're going to enjoy all to speak. I think so. <laughs> Ajahn Anand said last week, 